uh, Thursday this week. So before we do that, let's um, let's flip through to the next slide, Owen, and see where everyone's from. So Owen's going to turn on the annotation tools, and if you could uh, just use an annotation tool uh, to mark um, where you are from. So, so the annotation tools should appear on the left as soon as Owen uh, have you given us permission, Owen. I ha I think I have. Because I don't think you've given me, you uh, haven't given me permission yet. Oh, well, that's, which is a bit that's rude, just because that I don't. It's because I don't. It's because I don't like you very much, James. Oh, well, there we go. <laughs> um, if you um, if you are successfully seeing the annotation tools, if you could then put something on, I'm going to use the pointer and point to myself being off the screen entirely. Thanks, thanks, Owen, for not actually even including Sydney where we are. That's a bit rough. <laughs> So um, if you've got the annotation tools on, if you could just mark where you are um, right. in Victoria Privileges. or if you somehow snuck from across the border into the webinar, that would be cool to know as well. All right. Um, select all. Well, this is our first experience with with WebEx. So there I've... we go. Someone's, so Deborah's managed to mark Melbourne. All right. Good. I don't think I can bulk add pr allow privileges. Really? Okay. okay. Looks like we're, we're learning about this tool. So I'll tell you what we'll get you to do instead while Owen is still trying to work out whether this is possible. Just in the chat, send us a message uh, where you're from in Victoria uh, or if you need to guiltily admit that you have actually snuck across a border somewhere. <laughs> Okay, Reservoir, thanks, Erica. It's great. Okay, some people are using the Q&A function as well. Um, so got some people from Geelong, Keysborough, and Burwood. Oh, great, cool. Reservoir, Burwood East, Southeast Melbourne, Roxburgh Park, so good. People from all, all over, that's great. So the, um, uh, the, the whole purpose of running this series is to basically help uh, Victorian schools with uh, remote learning. When we discussed this series originally um, uh, with Deb and the folks from the department, we anticipated we were really only going to be helping um, primarily schools in the Melbourne and, and Mitchell area um, but unfortunately, um, things have got worse, as well you guys know. And so this series is basically now designed to help uh, teachers by delivering some digital technologies um, where we'll do some of the initial teaching and then you can actually support that with activities in your, um, uh, in your schools. So, um, all right, Owen, let's go on to the next slide. Then we're going to have to adapt live because originally we thought we'd be able to get everyone to annotate. So could I get you, rather than using the Q&A, could I get you all just in chat to send some messages as to whether you're, whether you, let's go to the next slide, do it, Owen, we'll just do it in one go. Um, tell us whether you're primary or secondary and whether you're just come here to do the PD today or whether you anticipate doing the live activities with us on Thursday as well. So if you're a primary teacher and you're just here for PD, if you could do primary space PD, um, if you're here for live on Thursday, if you could do, for example, secondary space Thursday, then we'll know um, who our audience is in terms of, uh, are you focused on PD or are you here for the Thursday? Yeah. Okay. Great. We've got some primary schools who are going to be with us on Thursday. That's fantastic. That's um, see whether we've got any secondary three, schools. So, so far we've got four. one, two, three, four, five primary schools, four of which are going to do it live on Thursday, which is awesome. Looking forward to that. And a couple of secondaries finally. I'm glad there's some of you here. Good, thanks. Thanks, Lee. All right, so we've got a bit of a mix and a bunch of you are coming on Thursday as well. Okay, so have we got good. any secondaries coming on Thursday? Um, uh, yes, Carly is the one. Yes, Digital Learning Correct. Services. Okay, fantastic. Good. All right then, so um, 
uh, let's get started. So what we're going to do for today's webinar is we're going to talk half half about primary uh, and secondary. We'll start with the primary bit, although the underlying concepts for um, primary will apply equally for secondary. And then we're going to talk about the cybersecurity um, uh, activity that we'll do with secondary, except there the ACA is currently working on a year five, six version of that activity for primary. So everything we talk about will actually be relevant uh, for both primary and secondary teachers, just not necessarily all for the activity on Thursday. So just a reminder, Thursday's primary activity um, is going to be um, uh, about our Wombot activity and algorithms um, uh, as the starting point. And then the uh, secondary activity for this week is um, our introduction to um, personal information security, so the introduction to cybersecurity um, challenge. But let's get started with algorithms. Thanks, Owen. All right. So an algorithm is a precise, um, as a sequence of steps, is a precise description of the sequence of steps and decisions needed to solve a problem. Um, so anything you can think of that is a set of instructions is an algorithm. So we we're using algorithms uh, every day. Uh, for example, uh, instead of going to work, uh, going to your home office and um, it, it is an algorithm because you follow a, a sequence of steps to get there. Um, uh, Yelling at your kids, you could also uh, to to um, get back to work might also be considered an algorithm. Um, so it's just a, a, a anything that is a sequence of steps and decisions needed to solve any problem. And the thing is, as a teacher, you're teaching algorithms every day. So the you know if you teach kids to add two two digit numbers together, that's an algorithm that they're following. If you're teaching kids the spelling rule to go from a base verb to a progressive verb, to go from run to running, for example, that's another algorithm. The algorithm has a sequence of steps. So the first step is look at the last letter of the base um, verb, check whether it's one of a known number of consonants. So this is now a decision we're going to make. If that, for example, is the letter N, um, then the rule says that you need to double the N and then put ing on the end of that to make running. Um, other verbs don't follow that exact pattern, so they don't have the, the doubling of those consonants. That's a simple example of an algorithm you teach every day. And so one of the key messages that we want both teachers and students to get is algorithms aren't just a thing that are sitting inside computers and are implemented by um, computer programmers or computer scientists but algorithms are things that every one of us do every single day. Um, and uh, our goal ultimately is for people to be able to see those algorithms and understand that an algorithm is only one of many potential ways of solving um, a particular problem. And if you see those as algorithms, it helps you actually expand your mind to thinking about other ways of solving the same um, problem. Um, so you go ahead, James. So in the Australian curriculum, um, the uh, the content is broken up or structured in terms of ten key concepts. the The concept that we're following here, the algorithms concept, starts um, in um, uh, foundation to year two as follow, describe, and represent a sequence of steps and decisions. Later on, students are expected to then um, define. Thanks, Owen. Um, to define problems, but then follow uh, the, the similar kind of steps and decisions. By year five, six, it involves adding. So we, rather than talking about decisions, we explicitly change it to talking about branching, which uh, means to follow one or other path through um, an algorithm. And you'll see why that is later on when we are um, uh, when we're looking at flowcharts. And the other thing that we add in year five and six is iteration. And so iteration is the idea of repeating some of the steps to solve a particular problem. Hey, oh, and at uni, were you one of those people that highlights your textbook? Um, uh, no. <laughs> just, you've, got the, you've got the look of someone that's doing that. Now, in terms of secondary, then we move into more specific things. So in year seven and eight, students are expected to uh, represent algorithms in two different ways. One is, um, diagrammatically, and we're going to see some flowcharts in a minute. 
um, as, as examples of diagrammatic representation of algorithms. And then in English, um, so an English description a, is, is what uh, computer scientists often call pseudocode. It looks a bit like code, but it's actually an English description. And the other thing we're going to do is trace an algorithm, which means to follow it through really carefully to check that the output matches the, uh, the expected output for a given input. And we'll talk a bit more about that later. Thanks, Owen. So just starting in uh, F2, this is what the content description says for the Australian curriculum. And it's also exactly the same for the uh, Victorian curriculum as well. Um, follow, describe and represent a sequence of steps and decisions needed to solve uh, simple problems. And we're going to do a bit of an activity um, like that. But I think uh, what we're going to do this time is, James, do you have an annotation? Oh, God, I'm the only. This was meant to be a group activity, and now I have to do it on my own. Yeah. I should have, should have thought of the consequences of this. Oh, God. Um, so James is going to draw the image that I'm going to describe. And by the way, if you're doing this with a primary class at home, um, then I've seen this work quite well where you just get the kids to actually do it on a piece of paper and then show their piece of paper back to the, to the webcam. So as I said, um, uh, I, um, uh, I have an eight year old, uh, it goes to the local, um, public school, Thomas, his class, uh, did a whole bunch of activities, um, remotely, uh, via the webcam. So get them to actually follow your instructions. Um, and then show you the pictures. And what we'll do when we do this session on Thursday, I think, we'll get the kids to come along with a piece of paper and draw the picture. Um, and then um, we'll show our picture. Um, and then after the session, you can get the kids to show you the picture that they've taken, uh, that they've drawn. And then you can talk about how close the uh, example is. So I'm going to follow Owen's instructions. Let's uh, see. Okay. Let's so on, uh, hang on, I Owen. Would... I need to find the actual. Pen. Okay. Okay, I've got a pen. Okay, good. Um, I didn't tell you to draw that, by the way. I just um, deleted it, Owen. You <laughs> sassy devil. All right, Owen. Okay, so on the left-hand side of the window, draw a rectangle that is um, twice as tall as it is wide, and that takes about two thirds of the entire screen. Yeah. Okay. Um, do the same on the opposite side, on the on the right-hand side. Oh God. Now my um, perfectionism is going to be really unhappy with how <laughs> rectangular these are. Okay. Um, so now uh, from the middle of the two um, uh, uh, rectangles on the one the closest to each other, draw a semicircle that connects the two um, from one middle to the other middle. It's not a straight line, but it's a semicircle like that. Okay, good. Um, and um, below that, so parallel to that semicircle, draw another semicircle. How do you have something parallel to a semicircle? Oh, it's another semicircle. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, draw that below that, but again, connecting the two. Um, like that? Yeah, draw another semicircle parallel to that one. Um, connect the, t the, the middle semicircle, connect them with a straight line. Um, connect the two. Oh no! Sorry, that um, my, that was a bad instruction. Um, <laughs> the two rectangles connect the two with a straight uh, straight line that goes uh, directly across. All right. Um, so from the straight line, um, join up the uh, the straight line in about seven parallel lines to the top. Um, to the top semicircle like that. All right. If you've got any uh, guesses of what this thing, what, what James is botched up drawing, then uh, oh, please, come on. Wait, please put it's it in the chat. It's my botched up instructions that I've been <laughs> given. Um, if you please type in the chat, if you have an idea of what this uh, should be. Any, anyone have any ideas or in the Q and A? Um, a bridge. A bridge. Not only a bridge, what ah. bridge? <laughs> Sophia. I think they're doing pretty well. Okay. So, um, so that's uh, what James drew. Oh no. 
I didn't mean to clear that. That's what um, that's what my instructions were. A rubbish. That was not what your instructions were at all. You saw it here live. It's been recorded. You know how bad those instructions were, everyone. Um, and when you're um, there's a there's a few things that I deliberately didn't do when giving these instructions. I didn't use the words Sydney Harbour Bridge in my instruction giving to give James a bit of context to what he was drawing. I was just describing the shapes that he needs to draw to create that thing. So what we're doing is I'm describing a sequence of steps, of lines, of things that need to be drawn to solve a simple problem, which is um, drawing uh, the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Um, in this. And, and, and the key thing here really, and why this is such a great activity, is one of the things that we really want kids to understand is how hard it is to give really clear, simple, but unambiguous instructions to someone to solve a problem. And we want to do this for two reasons. Number one, it's actually a really valuable skill in itself. Um, but number two, computers are basically the dumbest drawer of a bridge you could imagine. Um, so computers are very good at doing the simplest things incredibly fast. But what that means is, is anything that's more complicated than that is something that we actually have to explain in excruciating detail for the computer to be able to do. And the computer can handle no ambiguity whatsoever. In fact, one of the key properties of a programming language, as opposed to a natural language, is that it has no ambiguity at all. There is only one possible interpretation of every computer program. Unlike with natural language, I, I personally feel like I followed Owen's instructions to the letter, um, but the result was still incorrect because his instructions were ambiguous. Yeah, and by the way, depending on the age you're um, teaching, you can do this activity with more or less um, steps. So you can see the house on the left there is probably an easier thing to get kids to draw. They're more likely to recognize what they're drawing along the way. Um, whereas the op the um, the uh, Sydney Harbour Bridge or a bridge more generally is a good example of something that's a bit more challenging that you can do with older kids. Yeah, and so this this activity can yeah be given to many different different uh, year levels, and um, that point of ambiguity is quite important. So in my instructions, I intentionally didn't give James what uh, direction the semicircle would be that connected the two. It's just. Um, so he says uh, intentional, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I think it is messed up. Um, and so there's a good uh, lesson in ambiguity that our graphic designer uh, came up with. So there's two different interpretations of the same sentence, um, whether it be uh, police helping uh, a dog bite victim or if police um, help the dog bite the victim. Um, just depending on where you place your emphasis, that can have two uh, very, very different different meanings of, of even though the words are the, the same. Um, so on our website, there's an example of this type of activity um, <clears throat> that isn't um, drawing, but it does uh, use Lego. So instead of um, drawing an image, uh, if you have a uh, little uh, cheap, um, small Lego kits, um, the activity is quite similar in that you'll, uh, there'll be an instruction giver and the builder and the student um, will describe what the person needs to build and uh, they'll see it uh, become a bit transformer-like and, and not necessarily resemble what it's meant to. Um, so there, there's lots of activities on that on yeah. our website. And so there's, there's basically lots of different variations of the draw a picture according to instructions or build a Lego um, kit with one person having the instructions and the other person having the pieces or you can do it with regular blocks. All you need is for the person who's actually doing the building uh, or drawing to not be able to see the original thing that they are meant to be reproducing and to only have verbal or written instructions. So it's also a good example of a, uh, of a literacy activity in that you can get kids to actually write out a set of instructions. And we'll show you an example in a minute of someone that's done exactly um, that with uh, with sandwich making. Okay, so as we as we move into years three four, there's uh, the same fundamental ideas are the same throughout the curriculum. We just add a little bit of complexity for for each one. Um, 
Um, so here we're defining simple problems now and describe, uh, follow a sequence of steps and decisions needed to solve them. So there's no actually new concepts here. We made steps and decisions before and <clears throat> um, it's still um, sequence of steps and decisions um, in, in, in year three for it as well. Um, so for this one, I'll just get you to type in the chat, I think, which ones you think are correct. So here you're going to have to follow the, our little, um, this is uh, our Wombot, and you'll see the Wombot quite a bit um, throughout this webinar. And it wants to get uh, one of the carrots. Um, can you put in the chat um, which option um, will, will successfully um, eat, eat a carrot? Okay, I'm seeing some options come in. All right, nice one. All right, okay, good. Yeah, so there's a uh, there's um there's there's two correct answers in this one, and some of you have got them both. Well done. Um, option two and option four will both get a carrot. Um. Uh, because to get the first carrot, you need to go forward two steps, then turn left, go forward um, four steps, um, turn left, two, left, and then two to get the first carrot. Uh, the fourth carrot is exactly the same, except you go six steps along to get uh, the second one in the first step, and, and, yeah. they're, the, and they're the same. And so, the kind of thing that you can talk about with an example like this is the fact that the... Um, uh, the, the patterns are quite similar. So the algorithm to reach the first carrot versus the algorithm to reach the second carrot are um, nearly identical apart from uh, traveling further forward in that, that first step. This is also the kind of activity that can work very well um, via remote learning. So you can either, you know, you can get kids to do exactly what we got you to do there, or you can do the reverse. You can just put the map up and get them to write out their, their set of instructions that they want, or you can use a poll to, to put up multiple choice options. There are a whole bunch of different ways that you can do that. You can also get kids to draw their own map um, and then um, hold the map up to the camera um, and get other kids in the class to, to, to then follow the instructions or come up with instructions for the map. So there's a lot of different ways you can do this, um, pen or paper or um on the screen like we're doing now yeah so this is uh the wombot which is our uh sort of version of the bbot uh, i assume lots of you primary teachers have used have seen bbots before um some teachers in tasmania um when we were doing a workshop there's so a saying i printed off a bbot and made a flat one and so this is um uh it was originally going to be called the flat bot um but we called it a wombot and uh name him flatso um, so this is uh, Flatso the flat ass Wombot, if you want the, um, his full, full, full description. Um, and so you can, uh, on the back of um, Flatso, there's some little markers there that you can print it off and laminate it and use a texter to write out your algorithm in arrows and then you can physically move it. So you can use that as, as a replacement for a Bbot and use the same um, Bbot, Bbot maps as well. So that's a, a free version. And we've, I've also written a um, online uh, course that does uh, takes that concept and does the programming of of the Wombot, which we'll give a demo in a in a little bit. And again, I mean the the printable makes it a nice version, but um, depending on what environment you're in, whether you're sending things home uh, with kids in terms of printables or entirely um, operating online, you can actually get kids to draw any picture they like that's roughly of the same size um, and then draw a grid and use the use the activity. The, the, the key thing about it, the, the Wombot that we came up with was that we wanted, um, the, the B-Bots are great. Um, lots of schools are actually using B-Bots, but the difficulty with the B-Bot is the kids can't actually see the instructions. They, all, they, they, all they can do is keep in their head and count the number of forwards left and right and um, backwards operations they're doing. So the part of the purpose of the Wombot, apart from being unplugged and the cost of a single photocopy rather than the, 
the, the cost of having a B-Bot is also so that they can explicitly see the set of instructions that they've written onto the, uh, the Wombot itself and then follow those instructions one at a time. Because remember, the, two, the three parts we're interested in, we want students to follow an algorithm. So you could provide them with an existing program um, already for the Wombot. We want them to represent one themselves. So we want them to write out that set of steps and we want them to design um, an algorithm to, to solve a particular problem, which in this case is just to reach the carrot. Yeah. Um, so as we move into years five and six, uh, the only concept that we're added is in terms of conceptual understanding is iteration. So it's something doing something multiple times. We're also getting our students to modify existing algorithms um, as well. Um, here's a video that we were going to show. Um, how, however, I think due to time constraints and the, our inexperience with WebEx, it won't let me uh, send the audio through to you all. We won't, we won't play it. But if you do have um, seven minutes to spare of your time, um, this is an absolutely fantastic video showing um, how to make a Vegemite sandwich. And um, James is going to run through that activity now. Yeah, so, so we're going to do a... Um... Uh, on Thursday morning, we're going to do this live. So I'm going to get all of the ingredients for making a Vegemite sandwich, and I'm going to put them on camera. Um, and what I'm going to ask the kids to do first is to come up with their own set of instructions for making a Vegemite sandwich. So the first thing we're going to do is we'll have a little bit of a chat, uh, and Owen and I will do it. Um, uh, or in fact, I don't remember Owen whether it's you or someone else sassy from the team who's going to be doing that with me on Thursday That's morning. Me. It is you. Um, so we're going to talk about even what is a Vegemite sandwich and what's not first. So we're going to talk about defining the problem first up, and then we're going to Owen's going to have a go at coming up with some sets of instructions, and your students will write their own sets of instructions for making a sandwich, and then I will follow. Um, some of those instructions um, and see whether the result actually is a Vegemite sandwich. And the, the video that Owen uh, displayed before, um, and Owen, maybe if you just want to pop the URL up um, into chat so people can have a look at it later. Unfortunately, yeah. it's an American version, so it is um, uh, peanut butter and jelly uh, uh, sandwiches instead. But basically what happens is this father here um, uh, he asked his kids to write out the instructions and then he follows the instructions um, that the students have provided, oh, sorry, that his kids have provided. Um, and uh, it, it, it's quite hilarious, actually. And doing yeah. it in class is a great activity. Um, it's one we've actually done previously with New South Wales Department of Education <laughs> teachers. Much to my embarrassment, the first time I ran this session, I actually left the Vegemite in a different room. My team has never let me live it down. Um, we're going to get it right on Thursday. <laughs> um, uh, and this is how you can take an algorithm and represent it in different ways. So we can have the step-by-step -step instructions here. But if you want to generalize uh, your algorithm, then you can um, turn it into a flowchart and add different branching. Um, you might make it um, be, um, instead of adding butter, a, a sensible branch might be if um, someone can't have dairy. And so you might use Nuttalex instead of butter. Um, in this particular example, we just ask um, how Aussie you are and depending on how, what they answer is, uh, determines how much Vegemite. Um, Hey, Owen, really there's, actually, there's actually a mistake in your algorithm. So if you say you're heaps Aussie, you don't get to put the bread together. Oh, no, you don't. I forgot the arrow, <laughs> I forgot the arrow there. <laughs> if, if, you're really, if you're heaps Aussie, then you have to eat it one-sided. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't put the bread together if you're heaps Aussie. Mm -hmm. um, we'll fix that for Thursday. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe I'll just give Owen a hard time. And depending on the year level, um, the level of detail that you might include in each of these particular boxes may well may well change a little bit. So for here, we just have butter the bread as a box, but for a year five or six student, you might take that and put inside what would be inside that butter, butter of bread. You get the knife, then you get some butter, then you spread um, it over um, 
spread the, uh, the butter over the bread and wait until it's covered and keep doing that until the bread has been covered. And so this looks at um, uh, what the level of detail required to precisely describe um, uh, what, what's going on here. And the level yeah. of detail might change depending on what year level you're teaching. Yeah. So Jason's just sent us through a message saying that he uh, did that with uh, year one and two uh, students during remote learning. Uh, the kids found it a little bit uh, challenging, but had fun writing up the instructions for how to brush their teeth. That's another great one. If you want a really curly one, get someone to write down the instructions for how to tie up their shoelaces. It's really difficult to actually describe that in a way that anyone else can reproduce. And for foundation, they um, had the uh, kids giving the instructions verbally rather than written. Another way you can do it, by the way, for the younger kids, if um, uh, <laughs> rather than just verbally, you can also get people to take a series of photographs describing each step. So if you use something like Padlet or any other tool that allows your students to uh, upload photos in a safe space, then that one can work really well. Um, Sophia's done this too with Year 3, 4. Um, yeah, dipping your whole hand in the Vegemite. My favourite version, <laughs> Sophia, is actually when they don't tell you to open the bag first, and so you basically smear the margarine all on the outside of the loaf of bread. That is a lesson the kids will never forget. They actually, in the last webinar, I had about five messages of the kids insisting that I eat the sandwich afterwards. I think just to test that it was actually an edible Vegemite sandwich. So, um, as Owen mentioned, the, the because we can control the level of detail, the other key concept that you can start discussing with kids at the same time is abstraction. So, abstraction is hiding the details of an idea, problem, or solution to focus on a manageable number of aspects. And this is something that humans do all of the time in communication. So if I give you one very simple um, and maybe slightly adult example is um, if you're, um, if a complete stranger asks you how you're going, you're probably going to say good even if one of your limbs has just fallen off. But if your best friend says how are you going, that's a uh, an invitation for a Shakespearean monologue of all of the problems in your life. So we as humans constantly control the level of detail we communicate depending on the circumstances we're in, and we use exactly the same skills to manage the, the complexity of a problem that we need to think about or a solution. Yeah. Um, so there's lots of resources um, that we made uh, last term when the sort of lockdown started. Um, they're unplugged resources that you can give to your students, and we call that the DT at Home series. And you can find about 20 or 25 different unplugged activities to teach digital technologies um, on our website. Here's a couple of our um, favorite ones. Um, the carrot hunt is quite cute and also involves um, the wombats. Um, the DT Laundry looks at um, different symbols and, and covers a bit more of the data representation and different or what different laundry symbols actually mean. And for high school, there's a logic gate activity and there's plenty, plenty of others, but um, most of them tend to follow a sequence of steps and a great way to um, teach algorithms while you're uh, doing so doing so remotely. Okay, um, so we've taken that Wombot activity that we did before, and we have actually got an online uh, programming version of it. So that the the concept here is you can teach the kids at an earlier year um, offline, um, but then when they get to actually implement their algorithms online, we've also got um, free um, programming challenges um, for them for them to do. And I was just going to show you a a couple, uh, a short example of that. And by the way, um, uh, this is an activity that we would anticipate you would do uh, between the sessions with your students. So the, the live things we're going to do, we'll talk about algorithms, we'll do an example of that drawing activity, we will um, do the Vegemite sandwich uh, task, and that will essentially take up the, the majority of the time for the, the primary live session on Thursday. Uh, Owen will do a quick demo to the kids of this um, and we can help you set up your students um, either before then. So if you get in touch with help at 
www.edu.au will help get your class of students ready and into the platform and you can put up links on you know whatever uh, learning management system you're using so if you're using um, you know Google Classroom or anything like that we can help you get your students up and in the system and you can see that what Owen is doing here now um, is uh, is using the Blockly programming environment. So this is the same environment that you would use um, or same type of blocks if you were doing Scratch or if you were doing code.org activities and so on. And Owen is just um, following the, uh, writing the steps necessary to, to solve this particular problem. He's done this a couple of times before. You can see he uses the duplicate button a lot. Um, because that's faster than actually dragging and dropping the corresponding block. Um, and when he does this, and now if he feeds it to the marking system, it's going to check that the Wombot does the right thing. And of course, in this case, we, the kids will already know before they get to the marker that it does all of the right things because it will have produced the square and, and, and drawn the picture that it needs to draw. Yeah, and so that's just uh, an example of um, what the students build up towards after, I think this is in the second module, they get to um, doing a square. So yeah. this is aimed I mean, at three, four it, students. Exactly, and it literally starts just with moving a single square forward. Now, the other great thing about this is that um, uh, this, this Grok interface has a lot of other features to allow you to see exactly where your students are up to with the automated marking. Um, and give them support by sending the messages via the tutoring interface. There's a whole bunch of different things that are built in there to make it easier. So Owen's just going to very quickly go in and look at the live classroom um, to show you how this works. So um, the live classroom basically shows activity that your students have completed in a given time frame. So we've just said in the last day, but you can actually change that window to a shorter time frame and allows you to essentially see almost as much as you could see if you were in the classroom with your students and they were doing these, these activities on an iPad or um, on a computer. Um, and you can go, if you click on one of those, Owen, you can congratulate someone, but you can also click through and see exactly what their solution is like. So here, mm -hmm. this student has actually completely solved the problem. If it was in, um, uh, if it was orange rather than green, then uh, you can see uh, now that's actually the same problem and they've uh, gone yeah, from see. not quite solving it to solving it. But if we mm -hmm. look at a different problem that maybe someone hasn't finished, yep, that's then fine. we can go and see a, exactly where their solution is up to um, and give them some help and support. Yep, so they've got the order of their blocks around the wrong way in this particular example. So if we... You can change their code and this is what your student would need to do, but that won't affect um, their own code. Their own code, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. So we're now going to move on to the, the secondary part, but this is something that, um, uh, as I said, within the next couple of months, there'll be a primary year five, six version of this activity available as well. So. Primary teachers uh, will will let you know um, uh, once this comes out, but it'll be within the next couple of months, there'll be a version of this for you. What we've got here um, is actually another activity, another ACA activity, and maybe, Owen, you just want to pop in the um, uh, the link to the resources uh, page. So yeah. we've developed a set of cards that on one side has a particular bit of information, and on the other side has whether it's okay to share um, that um, uh, that particular bit of information, and we're just going to do a couple of these on the screen now. So let's let's go with the first one, Owen. Yeah. Is it okay to share your name online? So, I'd like you just in the chat to say um, okay or don't. Um. We've got a mixture of got a mixture. We've got okay so far and a don't. In the interest of um, going through, I'll just show you the answer for this one. Yep. Um, and the answer is it's okay to share. 
Um, as long as you don't share it in conjunction with other information that pinpoints your location. So, for example, sharing your full name and part of your address can be much more problematic, but there are lots of systems and places online um, where your name appears and that on its own isn't necessarily a major problem. Next one. Your town or city. Okay or don't. Okay, we've got some okays. Um, yep, that one's also okay. And again, sharing that on its own is okay, but if you're sharing it in the same platform where you're sharing your name, for example, then you might need to be a bit more circumspect about it. Your right. banking... <laughs> I think this one's yeah. hopefully fairly obvious. If, um, if anyone puts a <laughs> yes, it's okay, if they wouldn't mind just putting it <laughs> on the screen now, that would be great. Um, Although we're not going to come down and use an ATM with your PIN in Victoria anytime soon, so you're probably safe for a while. Home address. Yep, don't do that. We've got a few don'ts there coming through. Um, I don't think anyone's put OK. Which is good. Yep, yeah. Which is good. And, and in fact, one of the things that we see not infrequently, parents are, uh, you know, uh, often very worried about what their kids are sharing online, but actually parents are often just as much the source of leakage of their kids' personal information online, places like Facebook and so on. My favorite couple of examples is if you take a photo of your kids on their birthday and put that online, then you've just leaked their, their birthday and date of birth, which is often used by uh, organizations to verify that you are who you say you are. Um, another example is when um, uh, parents take a photo of their kids outside of their school, often the first day of school, especially when they first um, uh, start school. One of the most common security questions is, what is the name of the first school you went to? Uh, very easy to find that kind of information these days um, because parents have often shared that years before kids even have their own social media accounts. Um, and so on. So the email address, um, I think this one can be a, a little bit trickier. If you if you post it too many places, you might uh, you might have an inbox full of um, of uh, things people are trying to sell you that I probably shouldn't mention in the webinar. Um, we've got some a couple of no's coming through. This one's actually uh, share with caution. Why is it only with caution, James? Well, look, there are plenty of times when um, sharing your email address is a thing that you need to do to, to access various services and systems. So you first of all need to be very clear about what you're actually signing up to and also whether it's a uh, private or professional email address. Um, but it also depends on um, uh, you know, your your own age, for example, and to what extent you're actually being supervised in the use of that email address. So as a, you know, professional, for example, my work email address is is public information. But that means I I treat it as public information. And so if someone has my email address, I in no way assume that I should trust them in any way, shape or form. And that's really where that uh, with caution comes from. Yeah. Now, we've got a number of posters you can find on the resources page as well. They're probably not super relevant to us uh, right the moment. Moment in Victoria, but um, it is something that's worth um, uh, downloading later on and putting up in the classroom, and it kind of consolidates some of those ideas from that card deck. So okay. now what we're going to do is we're going to do an example of the, the cybersecurity challenge. So what we're going to do with secondary students is we're going to... Um, talk about cybersecurity for a period of time and the, in the, the live session on Thursday. And then we're actually going to get them started with this activity. And let me tell you a little bit about the activity before um, Owen gets underway with the first uh, question. So um, there are many, many cybersecurity activities out there in the world that um, basically finger wag at kids saying, don't share online, don't share, it's not safe. The horse is entirely bolted on the sharing front. What we really need is we need careful or sharing with caution. And to be cautious, you need to understand 
what kind of sharing can be dangerous. And so what we've done is we've developed a system where kids can see from an attacker's perspective how their information can be both leaked um, uh, deliberately or inadvertently and then exploited by someone. So in this activity, your name is Sam. Uh, Sam is a member of the school's White Hat cybersecurity team. And Sam is asked by other characters in this fake world to extract information from social media environments. Now, we've built a fake version of Facebook, um, uh, which we oh, call fist bump. fist bump. We've built a fake version of Instagram, which we call Flash Tag. And we've hired um, roughly 20 14 to 16 year old actors to be characters in this world. And the whole purpose of it was for kids to actually see by extracting the information themselves how easily people um, uh, give away information um, about themselves. And our experience is that this is extremely well received. So the, the four cybersecurity challenges that we've developed, this one being the first one, we've nearly had 80,000 students participate in these activities over the past um, roughly 18 months since they were launched. Um, the things we hear kids say are things like, oh, I did that the other day, or my friend did that, or my mum did that. And it really is both a great conversation prompter um, to talk about cyber uh, safety and security issues, but also the, uh, the content in each of these challenges is presented by our industry partners um, who come from the big four banks, British Telecom and um, off cyber. So, oh, and if you go back to just one of the slide, the earlier slides there, we won't play a video, but um, uh, these segments are all presented by cybersecurity professionals, some of which uh, their job is literally to do exactly this kind of sleuthing to ensure that, for example, senior executives in the banks are not open to having their information, um, uh, their passwords guessed and things like that using um, information that they've leaked online on social media. So um, we're going to do an example here. So Sam has been asked by um, the uh, Christy. character Christy um, uh, whether or not Sam can find um, Fabian's home address. Um, so we're going to have a look at the various apps. Um, so we can scan down. Um, you can use uh, Control or Command F to find particular entries. And here we see an entry with right. exactly the kind of thing we're, we're looking for. So notice that this is two things have happened here. Number one, um, Fabian has given away part of the information. So he says 12 Clissold Street. Um, uh, but the other thing is that then his friend Harry has actually leaked the rest of the information. So it might have been that Fabian was only planning on reminding um, uh, Harry uh, what the actual street name was, thinking he would protect himself to some extent. So this is a demonstration that that not only you, but the people around you um, can actually um, uh, leak that information. Yes, I want an image seems to have gone missing there, I'm afraid. Um, All right. So what, the, uh, what this challenge takes students through is the first challenge is, uh, sorry, the first module is uh, about leaked information online. The second module is um, about passwords and password management. And we're going to do some examples about that in a minute. Um, and uh, what kids can discover is how easily their passwords can be guessed if they use any information from their real life as part of the password. We also talk about um, uh, password uh, you know, policies of not reusing passwords or the complexity of passwords. And finally, we look at two factor authentication. And all of those things um, are built into using this fake phone environment. The, the final one that's worth probably before you flip back, um, yeah. Owen, that's worth having a look at is um, if you look at the trickier sleuthing, the last module there, Yeah. it also covers um, uh, what you can find. Um, about people from photos they've taken. So often photos will re reveal other information. So click on that next one. How much can you find out? So if you um, 
uh, click back there and then look, there's a photos app. People often inadvertently share information um, and photos. Now here, we, you know, the examples deliberately include a lot of different information that could be leaked from photos just to demonstrate how easily, um, uh, you know, taking photos around your room can, uh, for example, or photos of things that you own. I mean, one of my favorites of this that every time I see it, I just immediately have to you know, message the person on Instagram or wherever saying, please don't show photos of your driver's license when you first get your L plates. You know, hurrah, I've got my L plates, you put them on camera. It's basically like saying to people here, take my identity um, and do whatever you like with it. So, check of, yeah. So the, um, uh, the challenge uh, here really takes kids through those activities and using exactly the same line of classroom interface we showed before, you can see exactly where students are up to and, and as I said, prompt those discussions about exactly uh, where they might be um, inadvertently, inadvertently leaking information in their social media um, accounts and so on. Okay. All right. Yep, been through those. All right. So I might just. Now, um, how are we going for time? Let's do this very quickly. So another activity that we're going to do on Thursday, although we won't do it using, well, we'll work out whether we're going to do it using annotations or not for Thursday, is to ask you which of the following um, is a good password security policy. So. Um, uppercase, lowercase numbers and symbols, eight characters minimum, reuse passwords, um, password manager, and so on. Um, rather than actually get you to do this now, we will do it on Thursday uh, in one way or another. Owen, oh, just jump us through to the next slide. So the first thing is, is a lot of things that people think are good security policies actually turn out to no longer be best practice. So for example, password complexity uppercase, lowercase numbers and symbols have now actually been replaced with advice that says you're actually better off with a pass phrase, which is a longer phrase or sentence um, that is easier for you to remember than a mixture of random uppercase, lowercase numbers and symbols or elite speak that, you know, <laughs> replaces, for example, the E's with threes and so on. Um, and uh, so actually this tends to lead to people choosing poor passwords or forgetting passwords and then writing them down somewhere or even worse, saving them somewhere on a phone or computer um, in a text file that is easily compromised. Um, the most critical thing on the list here is not to reuse a password. So because um, even if your password is a good one, Sites get hacked at various points. The password list, if the passwords are not stored very securely, can be compromised. And then whatever that username and password is, if you use that on other accounts, then they're all compromised as well. So um, then the two big bits of advice that we'll talk about on Thursday is using a password manager and using two-factor authentication. And there are examples of those in the... Um, uh, in the challenge that that consolidate those yeah yeah okay so in terms of setting up students to participate you've got a couple of different options in using these challenges for primary and secondary if you first of all you need to log in as a teacher and you can use your new um uh department of education email addresses to, to sign up using two-factor authentication so when you go to the Grok Learning site. So you go to groklearning.com. Um, the thing that you'll be presented with first is what form of, um, so you click on um, login. I'll, I'll do it, James. Okay, you're gonna do it live. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So go to Grok Learning. And if you click on um, login, then as a Victorian teacher, you can click, um, is it uh, uh, use SSO? Well, yeah. yeah, exactly. So if you click on use SSO and click on Victorian um, State Government Education and Training, you click on that link and it will take you through the normal um, uh, single sign-on. In fact, if you're already logged in with EduPass, then it will just ask you to confirm that you want to share your information, which will be your first name, last name, your email address, 
um, uh, with the uh, Grok Learning site, um, and then you can log in. And at that point, you'll then have access uh, as a teacher to um, being able to register your students in the Grok Learning environment. Um, uh, and you can either manually enter your students or you can upload an Excel file that contains the student data already. The um, uh, teacher dashboard um, allows you to do that. So let's, let's just go and do that quickly. Here you go to teacher dashboard, register students, and then if you click import students, you can either do it from a spreadsheet or Google Classroom. If you click spreadsheet, um, it'll take you through, um, uh, if you click on the help button at the top there, oh, you can see import students from spreadsheet. Click on help, it will take you through all of the steps in the process to do that importing. Um, and then you can set up your students. Um, if you're a, um, a digital technologies teacher in a primary school or an ICT integrator, you can actually upload multiple groups and uh, set them to being in a particular group. Like here, um, we set up this example, Hermione and Ron, um, as uh, belonging to the Wizards group. Uh, um, and we can, uh, you can add uh, arbitrary group names that could correspond to different classes and things like that in your school. Once you've registered those students, the, um, you can assign them particular activities. So if we go back to the teacher dashboard, please, Owen, um, you can, um, oops, you actually registered. registered. But, yeah, okay. um, so you can then take a particular group that you've created and you can see the groups now here. We've got uh, the wizards. Owen has added one, <laughs> number two, and you can assign them to a particular activity. And the activities that we've um, we've looked at today, uh, you can assign them to uh, the DT mini, uh, challenge. Uh, mini challenge Wombot for the primary school version. And if we were to do the the high school one while we're here for this week, it'll be um the information privacy and security school cybersecurity challenge so that's how you sign up your students if you're having any difficulty doing that sign up uh, between now and when you'd like to do the activity please uh email um uh help at aca.edu.au um, or you can also mail um support at grocklearning.com and we'll get you set up and ready to go for thursday